Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Amanda Benton. I am an assistant director of alumni relations at Marist and a graduate from the class of 2011. Very excited to welcome you all here this evening for the Handel Crom lecture in conjunction with the Hudson River Valley Institute. This year's lecture is titled Discovering the Hudson Anew, Exploring History and the Environment from an Artist's Perspective. It'll be presented by James Lancel McEnany. Sorry, McHelany, author of Sketchbook, Sketchbook Traveler, Hudson Valley. If you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone. I'll provide that number and code in the chat for you right now. Um, you can switch over to that while keeping uh, your screen on for visuals. Due to the number of participants, you will notice that you have all been muted except for the host and the panelists. You can use the chat or the Q&A option to send any questions. If you send them through the chat, you can direct them to me, Amanda Benton, or all panelists. And we will take care of those and answer all questions towards the end of the presentation. Please do not send private messages to Tom or James as they will not be looking through those throughout the presentation. I'm now going to hand it over to Tom Wormuth who will provide a brief intro to the Hudson River Valley Institute as well as to today's presenter. Tom is the Vice President for Academic Affairs at Marist and Director of the Hudson River Valley Institute. He graduated from Marist in 1984. Tom, thanks for spending some time with us this evening. I'm handing it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Amanda, and good evening, everyone. A special welcome to everyone here tonight. And I want to take a moment right at the beginning to thank the Marist College Alumni Office for hosting tonight's event and welcome everyone to the 10th annual Handel Crum Lecture Series in Hudson River Valley History. Now, the Handel Crum Lecture Series in Hudson River Valley History was established through the generosity of community leaders Bernard and Shirley Handel and Lieutenant Gilbert A. Crum, U.S. Army retired, to promote the knowledge and appreciation for the rich history of this unique and important region of America. Shirley and Bern Handel are with us tonight Shirley is on the HRVI Advisory Board, of course, and together they are well-known civic leaders and community boosters in the Hudson Valley. Now, thanks to the virtual lecture, we're also able to have members of the Handel family from as, as far away as California uh, joining us this evening, and a special welcome to them as well. Now, there are several members of the Hudson River Valley Institute Advisory Board that are here with us tonight. Alex Reese, the chair, Peter Beanstock, Margaret Brinkerhoff, Eileen Cook, Frank Daugherty, Alan Miller, Mary Edda Schneider, and Denise Van Buren. I would also like to recognize several members of the Marist trustees who are here tonight. Uh, Stephen Efron, John O'Shea, and Janine McCormick. Now Janine, along with her husband, Michael, who is also in attendance, recently established a very generous scholarship program at Marist in partnership with the Gilda Lerman Institute of American History. Tonight, as an integral component of that scholarship initiative, Marist is officially launching the Long Reach Society, a special enrichment program for GLI scholarship recipients and other select students. Long Reach is named for the section of the Hudson that passes right by the Marist campus and will provide enrichment opportunities to Marist students who demonstrate exceptional achievement in the humanities. These exciting new opportunities for our students are a natural fit with the Handel Crum Lecture which is HRVI's premier annual event. And I would like to offer a special welcome to the inaugural scholarship recipients who are in attendance this evening. I would also like to introduce Colonel Jim Johnson, the direct, executive director of the Hudson River Valley Institute and the Frank T. Bumpus Chair in Hudson River Valley History. I especially wanna thank Jim for all the work that he did in planning and executing 2021 Handel Crum Lecture. And just a, a quick word on the Hudson River Valley Institute which of course here at Marist College is the academic arm of the National Heritage Area, the Hudson River National Heritage Area. And its mission is to promote the study of the Hudson Valley, its history, its culture, its art, its literature, it does so through many different means, uh, ranging from uh, community events, uh, lectures like tonight, as well as the journal, the Hudson River Valley Review, the autumn issue will be available in uh, actually be sent to subscribers uh, very soon. Let me just move one thing here. Now, our speaker tonight is James Lancel McElhaney, the 2021 Handel Crum Lecture in Hudson River Valley History. His lecture is titled, Discovering the Hudson Anew, 
exploring history and the environment from an artist's perspective, which is drawn from his recent book, Sketchbook Traveler, at yeah, Hudson Valley. James Lancel McElhenney is a visual artist, oral historian, and fine uh, press publisher. He attended the Tyler School of Art, where he has an MFA and received an MFA in painting, the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and Yale University, where he also received an MFA in painting. He has received both a Paula Krasner Artist Grant and a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and has published multiple guides on painting and drawing, and has authored books of his own, including Sketchbook Travel, Hudson Valley. His work has been featured in installations at the Independent Seaport Museum in Philadelphia and the Hudson River Museum in Yonkers. This evening, James will share the historic backstory of his practice as a topo historical pictoriographer and explore, explore how the arts can be used to interpret key elements of Hudson Valley history to a diverse citizenry, to advance public education and to promote community engagement. I will now turn it over to our speaker for tonight, James. Thank you, Tom, for, for the wonderful introduction. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Having been asked to unpack my creative process, I'll do my best to share a few thoughts about mindful travel through drawing and writing, which for the sake of tonight's program will be focused on the Hudson River Valley. Let me begin by going back 30 years when I when I had an epiphany about how human endeavor is conditioned by configurations of waterways and terrain. At the time I was living in Richmond, Virginia, exploring through a series of landscape paintings, how Civil War battlefields reflected the way the American landscape is shaped by a quarrel about what it is. During this period, several things hit my radar that would nurture my development. Now, the first was my introduction to the writings of Benson J. Lossing through his 1874 pictorial field book of the Civil War. His earlier book, 1866 book, The Hudson from the Wilderness to the Sea, would accompany me on my travels along the river that we'll be exploring tonight. And the second was John Brickerhoff Jackson's Understanding the Vernacular Landscape, a collection of essays recommended to me by Cynthia McLeod, who was at the time the superintendent of the Richmond Battlefield National Park. One quote from Jackson's opening piece was especially resonant. Get to Jackson. Quote, landscapes do not occur in nature, but are created when people adapt terrain to their use, end quote. So human desires are often in conflict. Thus, any location becomes a palimpsest, a layer cake of competing systems of value. Prior to embarking on the battlefield project, I had considered retracing George Catlin's first journey up the Missouri River. Ryan W. Dippy's remarkable book, Catlin and His Contemporaries, introduced me to a host of expeditionary artists like Seth Eastman, Alfred Jacob Miller, the Kern brothers, and John Mix Stanley, who opened my eyes to a different history of art, not just about self-expression, but about the pursuit of knowledge. But pouring over maps drawn by cartographers like Jed Hotchkiss and Peter Mitchie stirred my curiosity, which led me into the realm of living history. It's a map by Hotchkiss. I became a volunteer interpreter with the National Park Service. I learned how to ride horses, but preferred mules. I learned how to handle a musket and how to draw maps, many of which saw use at major battle reenactments, like you can see the one on the left. So this immersive approach to research remains an important part of my practice. Moved to Colorado in 1998 
I shifted my attention to Western battlefields, uh, including those involving clashes with indigenous peoples. Most troubling of these was, was uh, a site that haunts me still. On November 29th, 1864, scores of non-combatant Cheyenne and Arapaho were slaughtered mercilessly by US volunteers at Sand Creek. Now the Institute of Western Art of the Institute of Western Art at the Denver Art Museum purchased one of my paintings of Sand Creek there on the left about the same time that it published a slim volume entitled West Point Points West that included an article on the Military Academy's drawing program by David Reel, who now is executive director of the West Point Museum. Reel's essay gave me yet another piece in the puzzle. Slowly, a different history of American landscape art came into, into view. Oops. Materializing around the familiar concatenation of solitary masters was a dauntless assortment of explorers, naturalists, and military draftsmen, scornful of danger, traversing the continent. Who in their right mind would not wish to join their ranks? But the moment of truth for me arrived when, when I arrived at the emergency room at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City. I suffered from an undiagnosed pulmonary infection that some, that some predicted would be fatal. Happily, they were wrong. Afterwards, uh, though, I found exposure to oil paints and solvents uh, intolerable. During the three-week ordeal, my future bride, Catherine Manthorn, brought me a watercolor sketchbook and a set of paints. One day, a sketch of the George Washington Bridge from a hospital lounge made the leap from sketch to finished painting. Suddenly, everything fell into place. Gradually, my priorities shifted from painting on easels to painting on page spreads in pocket-sized notebooks. So some of you may be curious about my process. As with the Battlefield series, before setting out to paint at whatever location, I would prepare myself by, by becoming acquainted with its history, folklore, geology, flora and fauna, studying maps, and researching past depictions. Once on site, the challenge is to find the best prospect to embody its character, uh, which is akin to posing a portrait subject, for example. Because research was such a large part of my artistic practice, it set me aside from a lot of studio artists and painters. So if I'm not a painter, what am I? So one distinguished scholar of American art, namely my dear wife, calls me a topo, a topo pictorial historiographer, which is a riff on John Trumbull's own struggle against being pigeonholed. In fact, I'm less interested in what painting is than in what it can do. So I'll talk a little about my process. This is how I teach in workshops and classes. And the first thing must, one must see is the shape of the page. You know, if you're gonna do any, if you're gonna draw anything, you have to, the first thing you're gonna see is the shape of the page. So uh, an empty page is never an empty space as within it are implied armatures of symmetry and dynamism known as the laws of quadrants and thirds. In my classes and workshops, we explore 18th and 19th century concepts for topographical rendering, mapping the images with movements, angles, distances, meets and bounds, defining forms with broken lines and developing value and color relationships by glazing one layer of color upon another to build up the image. Think of this not as a technique or a recipe, but a thought process of exploration and discovery. Anyone can draw what they know. Going after the picture first puts the cart before the horse. Drawing to teach ourselves what we behold increases what we know and thus what we are able to draw. Now, my own personal approach may vary from day to day, you know, all depending on you know, the location, the weather, and a host of other factors. 
Opening moves involve working with multiple foci. This divides, and this is Olana, as we know. This divides each painting into episodic fragments because such an elongated image cannot be taken in by a single glance. One must look first to one side and then to the other. Now, reading a book from side to side and top to bottom is something we do by default. But, you know, the gutter between, um, between pages in an open page spread, in an open page spread creates a diptych. So that, that became my canvas. And sometimes I would add written notations. So this is sort of showing a sequence. This is from a workshop I did at Alana last fall and gradually building up the color. Oh, starting with graphite and then elaborating with ink, removing the graphite, then starting with warm and cool color and, and building and trying to develop the image. And this was done over the course of a couple of hours online uh, at an Olana workshop in November, I believe. So as I said, sometimes um, I will write on the, you know, the page uh, and you'll, you'll find images and words side by side. And this is an expeditionary practice. And it's also commonly found in Asian art in which pictures are often combined with calligraphy. So my goal is not to create a finished work of art, but the visualization of an experience as a complete idea. This is because working outdoors, one has no control over the weather and a variety of other, of other factors. So I travel light, I carry all my drawing and painting tools in a travel vest and a small field bag. Sometimes I carry a folding camp stool or small roll up table. And here you can sort of see my, my field practice unpacked and, and uh, also the idea of carry in, carry out, leave no trace uh, to observe that strictly is one of my rules. So in exploring the Hudson Valley, I try to be mindful of the fact that I'm traveling the footsteps of others like William Guy Wall and John Ag, Jacques Gerard Milbert, and Benson John Lossing, and the late Don Nice, who, whose image of uh, Hook Mountain is in the lower right, traveled large, long stretches of the river in an inflatable boat. You know, people ask me all the time which Hudson Valley location is my favorite. Who can I put first among so many old friends when, when I love them all? Again, William Guy Wall. So tonight, let's follow the river, pausing here and there to climb out of our canoe or to disembark from our steamboat or to step out of our SUV to discover the Hudson anew. Our first stop will be the confluence of the Sacandag and Hudson Rivers near, near you know, the villages of Hadley and Lake Luzerne. In 1820, Irish landscape painter William Guy Wall and travel writer John Ag followed the Hudson from the Southern Adir Adirondacks to New York Harbor. Published between 1821 and 1825, Wall and Ag's Hudson River portfolio, which we see here, consists of 20 color intaglio prints, eight of which depict waterfalls, ready to power new mills and factories. Ag describes the land around the mouth of the Sagadaga as, quote, broken and precipitous and the natural course of the current is impeded and distracted by large fragments of stone, which choke up the narrow channel. The character of the scenery is wild, ferocious, and solitary sublimity, 
Lofty and irregular acclivities covered the gloomy verdure of interminable forests and glens, over whose terrific depths unchanging darkness lowers. I, I don't see it in, in Wall's image. But touring the area around the same time as Wall and Ag, French naturalist Jacques Gerard Milbert described the area as sad, as quote, sad and uncultivated for along with the loss of the magnificent forest cover, all the creatures which once livened and embellished it have vanished. On the summits, I found only an occasional snake and some insects, end quote. So visiting Wall's point of view, I found myself drawn to a pair of, there's Milbear's print of, of, um, of the view of the river having looked south from, um, as I guess that would be Rockwell Falls, having looked south downriver. So I, so I went to Wall's point of view, I found myself drawn to a pair of spans across the Sacandaga, a, po a parabolic lenticular bow tress structure on the right, built in 1885, had replaced the covered bridge Ag and Wall would have crossed in 1820. Falling into disrepair, the bridge was closed to traffic in 1994. Saratoga County, County explored the idea of replacing the bridge until the Adirondack Architectural Heritage and others stepped in with the funds and the know-how to restore it. So the bridge was reopened to automatic, uh, automotive traffic in 2005. So if we look beyond uh, the lenticular truss bridge, we see a deck truss steel bridge, is a technical term, built in 1943. Both spans rest on masonry stone piers. Now the challenge of rendering a scene like this is to favor neither the architectural elements nor their natural settings. So I decided to address the stone piers of both bridges as though we, they were geological formations like the mittens and mesas of Monument Valley. The girders and cables of the bridges seem to rhyme with the tangle of trunks, branches, and foliage rising from the banks, and with the mortar-gapped masonry. Looking back across the Hudson towards my point of view and Wall's point of view on that point of land on the left, so the rocky stream was much the same, but the surrounding area had changed. The pastures, the meadows, and stump-littered fields had all but disappeared beneath a new forest spreading out as far as the eye can see. See, late 19th century clear cutting and brush fires ravaged the understory of the Adirondacks, which greatly reduced groundwater retention, which in turn decreased the cubic volume of navigable waterways like the Hudson River and the Erie Canal to such a degree that commerce was threatened. So reforesting the, at the Adirondacks was motivated not just by nature lovers, but by the same eagerness for revenue that had created the problem in the first place. At the mouth of the Sagandaga today, wild space has reclaimed its own, save for a whisper of human desire in the industrial blemish of these two bridges. Our next port of call is a lock on the Champlain Canal at Fort Miller. During colonial times, fortifications were constructed along the western shore of the Hudson to protect a portage or carrying place above a set of falls upstream from the mouth of the Battenkill River. These were improved and enlarged during the French and Indian Wars. Uh, across you know, the river in, in uh, you know, the village of like what is now Fort Miller, a supply depot was established to support Fort Edward a few miles upstream and Fort George at the head of Lake George. It was here on August 16th, 1777 that Lieutenant Colonel Friedrich Baum received fateful orders that dispatched 
his command to its doom along the Wollumsack River. Baum's defeat and the loss of native native levies uh, helped to contribute to General John Burgoyne's surrender two months later at Saratoga. In his letter press text that accompanied William Guy Wall's rendering of, of the area that we see here, John Ag writes, quote, there are some considerable falls and rapids near this place. Over these falls, it is by no means unusual for raft men to precipitate their craft. The usual course is by a short canal entering the Hudson at a distance above and below the bridge, which avoids the falls altogether. General Putnam, Israel Putnam, is said to have been the first to have tried this daring achievement. A party of Indians had come upon him suddenly, you know, the balls flew in showers about his head. But trusting in Providence, he pushed off his boat, and although eddies whirled about him, he ultimately succeeded in rescuing himself from imminent destruction to the terror and admiration of his superstitious enemies who attributed his escape to the assistance of some supernatural power. So now, of course, the area between the, the you know, Mohawk River and Lake Champlain would soon be, be popularized through, you know, the like leather stocking tales of James Fenimore Cooper. Now as then, Fort Miller is a pleasant hamlet on the banks of the Hudson River next to one of the locks on the canal that links the Hudson to Lake Champlain. So on May 20, 27th, 2015, architectural historian, novelist, raconteur, and longtime painting companion, James Howard Kunstler and I piled into his pickup truck and headed off to paint at Fort Miller. I was drawn to a pair of dredging barges that rode on the stream, cranes at rest, cables slack. It was unknown to us if the barges were engaged in a PCB cleanup operation or simply maintaining channel depths. Like drowsy dinosaurs, these dystopic gate crashers disrupt what might be a visually harmonious pastoral with rusty dissonance. A piquant, piquant reminder that the Hudson Valley is a going concern, a working way that mingles beauty with muscle. Now the next site needs no introduction. Olana. So sweeping magisterial vistas surround the hilltop area that Hudson River School painter Frederick Edwin Church called the center of the world. He wrote to Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in 1880, quote, nature has been very lavish here in the gift of her beauty. I am sure you would enjoy the noble scenes which our windows command, end quote. I had just arrived from the city to deliver Kathy to a meeting at Church's palatial Moorish revival home. The building was inspired by Church's, uh, by Church's uh, travels in the Holy Land and Petra, and designed in collaboration with the architect Calvert, Calvert Vox, whose partner, Frederick Law Olmsted, had led the, the creation of New York Central Park. But late in his life, arthrite, arthritis made it impossible for him to keep painting. So he set, it, he set his art aside and began to focus on the grounds of Olana which blend picturesque terrain with a working farm. Uh, you know, the boundaries between open spaces and woodlots were defined, carriage roads and paths would lead visitors to dramatic Belvedere's. So today the site, the site has been largely restored to its stunning late 19th century appearance. The day was warm as we approached from the west. Approaching from the west, rain clouds hovered above the Catskill Escarpment. One week earlier, Kathy had 
had spoken at a symposium at Tate Gallery in London. And instead of lodging near the British Museum, as we so often do, we decided to rent an Airbnb in Greenwich and traveled mostly by water. One of our excursions was to the Marianne North Gallery, pardon me, and the Royal Botanical Gardens at Kew. Now, North was a friend of church and had been a guest of Olana. She was an artist who traveled all over the world painting mostly botanicals. Uh, but she had been a friend of church and had been a guest at Olana, at which, as we know, crowns a hill that rises above a wide grassy slope. Sitting on the stone steps, like staring out towards the mountains, I was reminded of the view from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, across the Thames, past the Isle of Dogs, toward the high-rise Docklands looming beyond. A guided tour spilled out of the house. Some peered over my shoulder. Out of courtesy or shyness, no one paused to comment, offer advice, or ask me what I was doing. I had become just part of the scenery. Hand in hand, a young couple walked to the edge of the hilltop. As they took a selfie, a drop of rain landed on the back of my hand. This is the painting I did that day. All of these thoughts sort of inform the process of painting, not in a technical way, but uh, I believe, and I'm, I'm certain that, that the more aware we are of our, sur our surroundings, the, the more we're going to draw from those encounters with nature and, and the world around us. So uh, extending west from the Catskill Escarpment, which you can see in the distance of this uh, sketchbook painting, uh, is North South Lake, which rests in the broad vale between the North and South Mountains. On its Eastern Rim, the site of the long gone Catskill Mountain House, which we can see here is that white um, structure, uh, is now a wide grassy ledge westward the land rides, rises towards Tannersville but before European colonists established settlements in the mountains indigenous farmers lived in the bottomlands using the heights as their hunting grounds but you know, the Dutch expansion into the region sparked like a resistance which escalated into warfare crops were, destro were destroyed and 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 the and the indigenous uh, you know people were 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 essentially cleared off to make way for for a modern economies. So exploring these mountains in the 1740s, Philadelphia naturalist John Bartram uh, found a number of new plant species. And, and he returned later at the age of 14, his son, William Bartram, uh, had shown uh, uh, a passion for uh, sketching and for drawing. In 1755, uh, John Bartram writes, quote, I designed to set Billy to draw all our turtles with remarks as he has time, which is only on, on seventh days in the afternoon and first day mornings, for he is constantly kept to school to learn Latin and French. So father and son had traveled to the Catskills two years earlier to North South Lake, attracted to a large growth of auricularia auricula judae, uh, a fungus, a tree fungus. The boy was about to test it with his foot when his father pulled him back away from a coiled rattlesnake. 
And despite protests from both, both uh, the father and the son, their heartless guide put the creature to death. So the, the exact location of this incident is, is unknown, but uh, decades later, Thomas Cole, you see here, uh, and, and others, uh, you know, came to this spot to paint. So they would have hiked along the rim of the Catskill Escarpment, scrambled over rock falls, and escalates to reach Sunset Rock, which, which we can see here. Um, I'm always struck by the liberties that are taken by these artists. This is my painting of it. But have a look at that back mountain, the, you know, the left slope of that mountain, which in fact is invisible from this point of view. Um, so I was always struck by the liberties taken by these artists who were unwilling to let the, you know, to allow the facts to stand in the way of a good picture. So having made notes on site, here's Bartram, having made notes on site, I later added a map and overlay and beside it a some thumbnail of Sanford Gifford's view from Sunset Rock. Here too, you know, the mountains are moving. Uh, <clears throat> over the years, I've come to regard any location on the sur surface of the earth as a palimpsest, as I said before, like a layer cake of competing systems of value and competing desires, not just as living things cr clinging to the rocky crust of a molten orb in space, but as our residual memories and desires inscribed upon the, uh, upon the terrain. That goes back to the quote by J.B. Jackson, that landscapes are, are, do not occur in nature, but are created when humans adapt terrain to their use. So the naturalist John Burroughs, who is an inspiration, was born near Roxbury in the Western Catskills. He later lived at Slab Sides, a woodland refuge in Ulster County. So drawing heavily on travels through the mountainous regions around the Hudson Valley and New England, Burroughs argued that deeper connections with nature would help to develop the mind and nourish the soul, advocating the practice of close observation. In his essay, The Art of Seeing Things, that appeared in Leaf and Tendril in 1908, Burroughs writes, to know is not all, it is only half. To love is the other half. Now to a neighbor's complaint that birds no longer uh, called at her home, Bur Burroughs uh, drew her attention to the songs of several songbirds naming each species one by one. Quote, you must have the bird in your heart, he told her, before you can find it in the bush. So toward the end of his life, Burroughs repaired to Woodchuck Lodge, a rustic farmhouse on the slopes of Clump Mountain near the farm where he was born. That's this structure here. His fondest retreat, was a recumbent boulder with a sweeping view of the valley. Full of memories from his boyhood, there he remains. A field stone wall, dry wall encloses his grave. His wife rests beside him. Oh, Kathy and I discovered the site on a ramble into the Western Catskills. So parking along the shoulder of Burroughs Memorial Road, we followed a narrow track north into the woods to arrive at a clearing anchored at the tree line by a large recumbent boulder, which we see here. So descending eastward, wild meadows reached out to broad vistas, no less inspiring in their modest bucolic charm than majestic wonders like Yosemite or the Grand Canyon, at least in my opinion. 
So hewn by the east branch of the Delaware River and the headwaters of Schoharie Creek, which feeds into the Mohawk River below Arisville, the Little Valley is the source of two mighty watersheds, you know, the Delaware and the Hudson. So beheld from Burroughs' beloved boulder, his boyhood rock, That hat, by the way, is from Crown Point. It has no, uh, it has no, it's not a political statement. That's Crown Point State Historic Site. So, so beheld from, from his boyhood rock, a harmonious patchwork of farm fields and woodlots offers a soothing view. Young Burroughs would have heard the clamor of steam-powered machinery echo through the valley and the song of the axe from deep in the woods. But his mountainside retreat was just far enough from the land of men to stand on the edge of God's country. So located on the left bank of the Hudson, this is downriver quite a bit. We only have a short period of time. But located on the left bank of the Hudson, a few miles above the Kingston Rhinecliff Bridge, is a rolling track of land that was first developed into a private pleasure park in 1849. Having built estates atop the bluffs, wealthy landowners decided to set aside a tract of uncultivated land for the enjoyment of nature and the improvement of health. German landscape architect Hans Jakob Eller was engaged to oversee the project. He divided the land between clearings and woodlands as, ch as church would later do. He laid out trails leading to vistas as church would later do. He set out benches and pavilions, Washington Irving, William Cullen Bryant, and other notable recipients of Astor and Delano hospitality are said to have drawn inspiration from their rambles at Poets Walk. In recent years, the park has come under the control of Scenic Hudson Land Trust, which maintains the trails and other amenities for year-round public use. Here we have Irving and Bryant, young Irving. Here is one of several views I produced over the years. Uh, it's Thursday, July 7th, 2011, 6.45 p.m. West across the grassy bluffs, past the distant shore, lies the Esopus Valley and the Ashokan Reservoir. Rising above these waterways are Overlook Mountain, Mount Tremper, and Shandaken. Obscured behind this stand of trees to the right are the cloves of Platte and Catterskill, North Mountain and the Catskill Escarpment. And the mercury that day was almost 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 70% humidity. Almost two hours before sunset, the atmosphere was hazy with a faint covering of clouds. My point of view is seated on a park bench alongside a trail descending northward from a large wooden pavilion that we saw in the first slide to the intersection with a trail that leads west to the edge of the bluffs. Having hiked the park on numerous occasions, I never met others on the trails without an exchange of pleasant greeting. Seeing at me at work, they might slow their pace in passing or steal a glance, but never interrupt. By celebrating natural beauty, such places might inspire bards and at the same time promote civility. Now moving further downstream, we see in the foreground uh, to the right, Constitution Island. It's the Eastern end of Constitution Island with West Point on the far shore. So this vista is from the Belvedere at Boscobel House and Gardens in Garrison, New York, which uh, is a absolutely wonderful place. 
uh, must see if you have not done so. Now the, the site attracts thousands, thousands of visitors every year and famed as one of America's scenic treasures. The Hudson Highlands were shaped by the river, by the river carving a path through an outcropping of basement rock extending northward from the Reading Prong of the Pennsylvania and Ramapo Mountains of northern New Jersey. And they reach across, they reach east to the Taconic Range. And the waterway, variously known as Mahayakanuk North River and Hudson's River, has been a thoroughfare since the dawn of human habitation. Rising in the Adirondack Mountains, the river flows more than 300 miles to its confluence with the Atlantic. In the early 19th century, more than 300 commercial vessels plied the waters daily between Troy and New York City. On September 14, 1608, the half moon dropped anchor in these waters. Writing in his journal, the later mutinous Robert Jewett described the setting, quote, the land grew very mountainous. The river is full of fish. At a choke point in the southern section of a series of waterways known to indigenous communities as the Great War Path, the highlands were always of strategic importance. During the American War of Independence, this stretch of the river was hotly contested. Crown forces captured Forts Montgomery and Clinton just 11 days before John Burgoyne laid down his arms uh, 150 miles upriver. West Point was fortified with outlying redoubts across you know, the river and behind in the Western Highlands. On September 25th, 1780, Benedict Arnold fled aboard the Swan class war sloop HMS Vultures in these very waters. So when a causeway was built for the railroad in 1851, which we can see here uh, across you know, the bottom of the page, wetlands behind Constitution Island were, were, were landlocked and areas of them were briefly converted into rice paddies. Now the plantation failed, but but traces of it remain in a grid of flooded ditches. There's Boscobel on the half moon. You pardon me, I get in, involved in the story and I forget the pictures. Um, <clears throat> the wetlands behind, behind Constitution Island, and Constitution Island is here, uh, it, it were converted to rice paddies, but traces remain as a grid of flooded ditches that crisscross the area. But uh, during the last hundred years, uh, toxic deposits of industrial waste from battery manufacturing concentrated in Foundry Cove migrated south into the marsh as, you know, with, with you know, the current of the river. Uh, which has largely recovered today after decades of remediation managed by the Constitution Marsh Audubon Society and Sanctuary. The wetland is frequented by numerous species of migratory birds and is a nesting area for, they think, roughly a thousand snapping turtles. So in the, in the Hudson from the wilderness to the sea, Benson Lossing uh, describes how Anthony Wayne, um, quote, was then in command of the Americans in the neighborhood of Stony Point. Burning with desire to retake the forts, he applied to Washington for permission to make the attempt. The cautious Washington considered when the impetuous Wayne, when the impetuous Wayne scorning all obstacles said, quote, General, I'll storm hell if only you will plan it. On July 16th, 1779, General Mad Anthony Way, Wayne did lead a night assault against a British garrison stationed 
uh, on a rocky promontory on the on the right bank of the Hudson River, which we can see in this map to the left. This is Stony Point and for planks landing across the river. Uh, <clears throat> Reaching into the river towards the Verplanks Point, Stony Point marks the boundary between Haverstraw Bay, to the south, and the southern waters of Peekskill Bay to the north. Advancing through waist deep water of a soggy marsh, Wayne's troops silently scaled the precipitous bluffs, taking the Redcoats by surprise. Now, I visited Stony Point on numerous occasions, and so I was familiar with the terrain. So between leafy tree clusters and grassy glades, the undulating ground is punctuated by large outcroppings of Ordovician limestone. Upon reaching Stony Point Lighthouse, the light mist, which is the next slide, it's a lighthouse from, from the Lossing book on the right. Looks almost the same today. Um, <clears throat> Upon reaching Stony Point Lighthouse, the light mist had begun to turn into a drizzle. Uh, so I set up my, my stool, my camp stool, and I began to map out the image. I was unsure if the rain would increase or abate, so I worked rapidly to establish a level of specificity sufficient to form a complete idea. So like looking south, I noted the distinctive skyline of Hook Mountain and the tours in the distance on the right-hand side. A few miles north of these heights, which we can see as this, as a point of land stretching into the river, Minisquiango Creek flows into the Hudson. It was along its grassy banks that the trader, Benedict Arnold, handed over plans of the American fortifications at West Point to to you know, the British spy master, Major John Andre. So making color notes on the page, I thought about, about my location and all I beheld. Behind me stood a lighthouse built in 1825. It was uh, a beacon for navigators. Just as a railroad, as, and, and also, Behind me as well was the road cut for the railroad, which had it been there during uh, Wayne's assault might have made his task a little more challenging. The Stony Point was and remained a strategic location for many years. King's ferry had ceased operations long before, but Stony Point and Verplank's landing across the river resonated with the history of transportation. This is the idea that I began to get, that why it was such a key place. It was a crossing place. Again, gravel, meanwhile, just north of Stony Point is, a, is an enormous pit mine from which is hauled gravel that is used, was used since the 19th century to macadamize countless highways. So as I packed up, back to my painting, as I packed up, um, the rain began to fall in earnest and my thoughts kind of echoed the words of J.B. Jackson who, who said, quote, and I still find myself wondering if there is not always some deep similarity between the way organizes space and movement and the way contemporary society organizes them, end quote. So a lot of you may not know that following the fall of Quebec in 1759, I was unaware of this for a long time, a group of British military officers traveled from Canada to the Caribbean, producing scenic views of the Crown's North American territories, drawing them on the spot not au plein air, they had just had a war with the French, so they weren't gonna use a French term, though. they called it on the spot drawing. Although seldom figured into the backstory of the Hudson River School, Thomas Pownall's renderings of the Great Falls of Cahos and the Palisades were published in London more than 60 years before Thomas Cole 
first stepped off a steamboat at West Point. So these dramatic cliffs are featured again as Cornwallis's troops scale the heights in a drawing by Thomas Davies. Uh, also, uh, well, he was an artillery officer, but also an eyewitness to the event. On a ledge further south, Alexander Hamilton had one final meeting with Aaron Burr with, as we know, fatal results. Through um, another view here we see is uh, the attack on Fort Washington. We can see the Palisades in the far distance, again by Thomas Davies, who in Canada is, who here is unknown, but who in Canada is seen as a national treasure. So throughout the 19th century, stretches of the Palisades inspired artists such as Samuel Coleman, we see here, Sanford Gifford, Louis Comfort Tiffany, and George Bellows, the Gifford again. A lot of people don't know that uh, before he was, uh, before he started working with glass and so forth, uh, that L.C. Tiffany was a painter. So Parklands atop the Palisades are traversed by the Long Path, a historic trail that's now part of the Empire State Trail. Short uh, distance between, uh, from south of the boundary line uh, uh, is a place called State Line Overlook, although the actual state line is a little further north, which is also accessible from the northbound lanes of the Palisades Interstate Parkway. Um, you know, the path at this point, the long path at this point is paved. Several walled promontories, like you see here, uh, have been constructed at the very, very edge of the cliff. So if you look north across the river, you can find Hastings on, uh, on Hudson with Dobbs ferry beyond and to the south are the wooded hills occupied by the Lenoir Preserve, Untermeyer Gardens and Trevor Park. And beyond the warm tones of masonry and tall buildings mark the location of downtown Yonkers, which you can see here. And this was the signature image of my uh, exhibition at the Hudson River Museum. Uh, I took note of a number of ocean going barges or ocean going ships, tankers, uh, a number of you know, the container ships and oil barges that passed by, trying to envision the Hudson in 1820 with a quotidian flotilla of steamboats and sailing vessels plying its waters, a major artery of trade and empire. Another view of the cloisters from just north of um, you know, the readout um, north of Fort Washington. Everybody knows the cloisters, I hope, anyway. It's a, a terrific like, uh, prospects of the Palisades. So the George Washington Bridge opened in 1932, which was, of course, the bicentennial of the birth of George Washington. During its construction, a ditch was carved through the basaltic diabase cliffs of the Palisades to accompany the roadway. In 1937, the states of New York and New Jersey created the Palisades Interstate Parkway Commission with Monument Park, AKA Fort Lee, as the Southern anchor. The access road was improved for the bicentennial of the, uh, of the American Revolution 1976. So an interpretive, an interpretive center was built with adjoining parking lots. Earthworks were restored to recreate the feeling of an 18th century fort. When I first visited the site on January the 2nd, 1991, the entry gate had a, a woebegone appearance. There was no sign of life. A long trail led to you know, the southernmost overlook from which one scans 
the uh, the western shore of Manhattan, reaching down to the harbor. So the views of the western banks of the Hudson reach down to Weehawken. So rebuilt for the bicentennial with lawn timbers and earth and fill mock artillery positions, ran from north to south through wooded heights just beyond behind the precipice. Fiberglass panels. I don't know if anybody remembers those fiberglass panels that were attached to the lawn timbers, simulated fascine bundles of sticks that were used as uh, revetments. When I saw them, they were cracked and disintegrating. And so the fort was once again falling into ruin. So the effect was doleful, desolate, like litter, soda cans, cigarette butts lay scattered among the dead leaves. Something about Fort Lee that people may not know uh, is that before Hollywood became the center of cinema production, it had been the headquarters of a number of companies, including Fox Film Corporation. Ashcan School Everett Shin worked in the movie business. Young Thomas Hart Benton found odd jobs appearing as an extra uh, in silent films, occasionally working as a grip. Scenes shot atop the Palisades in the 1914 serial of Perils of Pauline. <sighs> Starring Pearl White, it gave American slang a new word, cliffhanger. Palisades. 30 years later, the park has been reborn with numerous improvements and increased visitation, observing the anniversary of the Battle of Fort Washington. Like, like living historians gather every year to interpret the Revolutionary War period with live demonstrations of drill, cooking, musket, and cannon firing until recently the forts 32 pounder rattled apartment windows and set off car alarms across the river in Manhattan. I actually witnessed this. So painting at Fort Lee a few years ago, I noticed two Korean women speed walking. Spotting me, they slowed to a halt and then wandered up, peering over my shoulder. I looked up and smiled. They smiled back. Any questions, I asked. Yes, said the older one. Are you married? The view from Fort Lee. Final image, Oyster Island, also known as Ellis Island, was first fortified in 1795 in preparation for what came to be known as a quasi-war with France. It was acquired by the federal government in 1808. A 20-gun battery was established, which in concert with the guns of Castle Williams on Governor's Island and Castle Clinton at the Battery in Lower Manhattan, created a kill zone at the mouth of the Hudson River. While it so, saw no action during the War of 1812, the island served as a prisoner of war camp during the conflict. In 1861, Fort Gibson on Ellis Island was decommissioned and repurposed as a naval weapons depot. By 1890, the flood of immigrants into New York City had exceeded the capacity of Castle Garden. The Navy va vacated Ellis Island. A new immigration inspection station opened its doors there in 1892. Remained in service until 1954, more than 12 million people passed through its gates to become permanent residents and citizens of the United States. Today, the site is part of Statue of Liberty National Monument and is accessible only by water. So this journal painting was made on the spot from Battery Park in Lower Manhattan. Looking across New York Harbor, I set up beside the East Coast Memorial that honors the sacrifice of U.S merchant mariners and army transport, transport service crews that lost their lives in American 
coastal waters during World War II. A dark lenticular cloud hovered above Ellis Island, both sheltering and ominous. It seemed to resonate with my mournful environs while at the same time crown, crowning the golden door, a symbol of hope like an angel's wing. So exploring these places with a purpose has enriched my life one location at a time. As Burroughs would say, the art of seeing is a practice. It's seeing is an art. George Perkins Marsh said, vision is a faculty, seeing is an art. The goal is not only the artistic production of pictures and stories, but also to discover oneself along the way. If the art is not found in how one proceeds, it cannot exist in the things that one makes. So last year is East Coast Memorial. And again, I hope you've all seen this a really stunning haunting place. So last year, Shiver Publishing released Sketchbook Traveler Hudson Valley, the first in a series of field guides to mindful travel through drawing and writing. It was conceived as a hybrid between a coffee table art book and a backpacker's companion. So the book includes historical background, instructional texts, a uh, number of my journal paintings and uh, with narrative captions, as well as blank work pages with watermark style inspirational quotes and back matter listing sites, resources, and selected readings. The hardboard binding is secured with an elastic strap in the tradition of a carnet de voyage. So two more volumes are now in production, one devoted to the American Southwest, which we can see on the right, and the other to New England. I have also just signed a contract with Schiffer to create a trilogy exploring past and present landscapes of the American War of Independence. Just as Powell Davies and Joshua Rowley Watson had recognized the value of drawing and journal keeping as a means of sharpening the senses in ways that transform experience into knowledge and ideas, my hope is that these practices will enhance everyone's experience with heritage tourism as we, as we approach the semi-quincentennial of our nation's birth. Meeting new classes for the first time, West Point Drawing Master, Thomas Gimbreed, would inform his cadets that there are only two lines in drawing, the straight line and the curved line. Everyone can draw a straight line and everyone can draw a curved line. Therefore, everyone can draw. All right. Gimbreed threw down the gauntlet. So let's all take up the challenge. One need be neither a poet nor an artist to benefit from deeper engagements with nature and their surroundings by picking up a pencil and uploading to the hard drive knowledge to be gained, memories to be cherished. I wish you all happy trails and hope to see you in the field. Thank you. Thank you, James. That was wonderful. We did have a few questions that came in while you were going. So I'm going to start with those. And for everyone else, if you have additional questions, um, you can go ahead and put those into the chat or the Q&A um, and I'll try and get to them. Um, I know it is already 8.12, so um, we may not get to every question, but we'll get through a few of them before we um, close out for the night. So. Well, I'm game if you are. I, I'm game. I, if, if people showed up, I want them to go home happy. Sure. Okay. So the first question was, um, you provided the histories of some of the scenes that you shared tonight, um, and they remain largely intact due to preservation efforts. How would you characterize the role of artists in documenting and preserving natural and cultural history? Well, I think, I think, um, it, it, it depends on what one's artistic practice is. Mine involves travel research, journal keeping. I'm not just trying to produce pictures, you know, to hang on the wall. In fact, I, I don't produce pictures that hang on the wall. They're in, but they hang on the wall in the form of prints, perhaps. But uh, 
Um, I, I think the same way that um, the British military by making drawing a requirement at Woolwich, not because they wanted to train officers to be artists, but they wanted to make them keener observers. They believed that, that if military officers could learn to draw artistically, they would become keener observers and they would produce military intelligence of greater value. It had nothing to do with art. And I think what an artist can do is, um, is to lead by example. You know, not, not to intimidate people. I mean, a lot of people think, well, I don't have any talent. I can't draw. But I, the, the, but, but the fact is that if you go outside with a sketchbook and you, and, you know, you draw a tree for an hour and it looks like Mickey Mouse, it doesn't matter. You're still going to remember that tree. That sort of haptic cognitive sensory process is going to burn the memory of that object that you're that you're observing in into your mind in a in a far more durable way than than uh, than than heading for the south rim of the grand canyon and you know taking a few selfies and a few snapshots and then heading for the el tovar bar which is a great place to drink but uh you know you want to have a deeper engagement with nature so i think I hope that answers the question. Yeah, no, I think that's perfect. Um, one of the, uh, oh, you spoke of your research ahead of drawing expeditions, but how do you select locations as subjects? Is it based on historical importance, interesting landscape features, or just personal preference? Well, it's, it, it, it's hard, you know, to disentangle all of those things. <laughs> that I'm, you know, I'm motivated by the desire to, uh, to discover new narratives. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, I mean, there, there is not, there are not a lot of pre-existing artworks of battlefields, shall we say, you know, that don't involve thousands of soldiers killing each other, but uh, just the landscape itself um i would say that my that i i select sites because of its narrative value i i will choose a site because of its narrative value and then once i get there it's uh up to me to find something about it that's going to be compelling visually that makes sense yeah that makes perfect sense um, so this question is, did you sketch the scenery from Mohunk and Minnewaska in Ulster County and the area in Mount Tremper? Oh yeah. Uh, th th yeah, they're just not part of this talk. I've got hundreds of images. I mean, if we could, we, we you know, we could do like a marathon slideshow and I could just, you know, unpack hundreds of images which we're doing slowly through these books. But uh, no, I've done a lot of, um, of you know, you know, the gunks and uh, Ulster County and the Western Catskills and the high peaks of the Catskills and the lower Hudson Valley and Hudson Highlands and so forth. Yeah, all of that. Actually, my grandparents honeymooned at Minnewaska. It's beautiful there. <laughs> a house that's no longer there, so. Um, I have two more questions. Um, the first is, uh, in the painting you showed us from the Poet's Walk, you cited a specific time. Um, how quickly does a view need to be captured before the time of day drastically changes that view, and how does that affect your painting style? Well, everything, uh, okay. I don't have a painting style, I have a practice. It changes from day to day. But what I would say is um, that uh, when one is working from observation, one is really working from memory. We're always working from memory because the minute you take your eyes off of the subject to look at your work, you're remembering the subject. 
And then when you look back at the subject to get more information, you're remembering the work. So I think this, this is something that needs to be understood that actually working from observation is developing memory. And so over the years, one learns how to make a decision about where they wanna land it. And so that once you have enough information on the canvas or on the page or wherever, um, then really you're just using uh, the motif, as it were, as, as a source of data. You know, you already made an, an aesthetic, you've already set your aesthetic goals. That's great. And then the last question right here is, is there a location that you have yet to study that you'd like to explore and paint? Thousands. <laughs> Nothing specific, though. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think apropos to this Revolutionary War project that that I'm embarking on, yeah, there are a lot of places I haven't drawn. I wanna I wanna go uh, this year and next year over the winter. I wanna go follow Henry Knox, or rather his noble train of artillery. Um, from Lake Champlain to Boston. And, and uh, you know, to the extent that I'm able to try to be on you know, at those locations, at key locations, uh, at the same time of year that he was. I don't know exactly the same day, but I you know, try to capture the feeling of that. That's one thing I like. And also I've got other projects going like in the Southwest and, um, but many, many locations. I mean, I think it was um, John Constable who said something like that, that there is nothing ugly in nature. And so, um, it's all about trying to develop one's point of view. And like I keep saying, anyone can benefit from drawing and writing as part of their travel practice without being burdened by, by the pressure of having to make art. It's only for you, you know? You're only doing it for you. Absolutely. Um, so the last question um, was actually in reference to where someone can find your book. Um, we can include a link to it in the email we send out tomorrow, but is there uh, an, anything you just want to say about where people can get your book before? It's in a variety of different retail locations. It's on Amazon. You can order it from the publisher, which is Schiffer Publishing, S-C-H-I-F-F-E-R. And they're, uh, they're in at Glen, A-T-G-L-E-N-P-A. Um, if, you, if you type in, uh, you know, the search window, um, uh, sketchbook traveler Schiffer, it will come up. Uh, or if you do the same thing um, on Amazon using my name so it's pretty easy to find okay great um so that is all of the questions that came in during your presentation and through the q a so i'm going to turn it back over to tom i know he has some closing remarks unless there's something else you wanted to add make one more comment and that is that 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 my essay in the spring issue of the hudson river valley review uh, explores naturalists and uh, and military precursors of the Hudson River School uh, is available, I would imagine, through the Hudson River Valley Institute. It's now a back issue, but again, it's a beautifully designed thing. And I think, I think it's uh, really proud to be part of this. It's a real honor to to have this essay accepted for publication here. So anyway, I would encourage anybody who is 
further interested in uh, the topographical tradition and so forth, um, which I couldn't really explore in detail. If anybody's interested in that, it's sort of unpacked with more uh, specificity in that essay. So I would encourage you to, to, to order a copy of the spring 2021 issue of the Hudson River Valley Review. Okay, James. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for um, promoting our journal. And uh, it's not the uh, uh, the past issue until the next issue comes out. It's still the current issue. Oh, the current issue. Okay. We we're very proud uh, to have it. For, first of all, I want to thank you for the the, the lecture. It was wonderful. And um, you don't have to just take my word. If you take a look at the chat session, it was just loading up with uh, comments. This was a real hit. This is really one of the uh, probably the uh, the best received lectures that that we've had. So thank you very much for. I'm very, I'm very humbled and grateful to hear that. I I I, I um, you know I'm never satisfied with with my speeches, and uh, I just want to make sure that I was able to get the point across and and try to get people excited about about you know the possibilities of drawing and writing as, as a codicil to their travels. And, and, you know, to give them like a deeper appreciation of history and environmental issues as well, so. Well, you did that. And even if you've never, you're not satisfied necessarily, the audience was. Um, well, just a they, reminder to the audience. And first of all, thank you everyone for coming for the Handel Chrome lecture in Hudson River Valley history. As a reminder, as James was just pointing out, the book Sketchbook Traveler is available for sale through Schiffer Publishing. I'd also like to remind viewers that the next issue, uh, again, the autumn issue uh, of the Hudson River Valley Review uh, will be arriving soon. So let me once again thank James uh, for the excellent lecture and I wanna hand this back over to Amanda for a final word. Thank Thanks. You. And thank you to James and to you, Tom, for hosting this event with us tonight, um, as well as the rest of the Hudson River Valley Institute. Um, I put it in the chat, but a full recording of this presentation will be available in the next day or so. We will email it to everyone who registered. Um, we'll also post it on our website, which is the link that's in the chat and our YouTube page. Uh, we'll also include a link to the Sketchbook Traveler in that email we sent out. Um, that's all we have for you this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your night.